Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tim Lodge. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota in chemistry and in chemical engineering material science. And I'm going to present two lectures in this series. Uh, one today, uh, beginning uh, to look at the applications of small angle neutron scattering to polymers, and then concluding on uh, Thursday, I'll give an outline uh, in a couple of slides uh, about what I intend to cover. I'd just like to begin with some disclaimers. Uh, there are quite a few equations that are reproduced in these slides. I do not guarantee that any of them are precisely correct, so uh, please be careful. Uh, before you use them yourselves. Uh, also, I have uh, selected quite a few examples from the literature. Uh, some of them are quite old, uh, almost 40 years. Uh, some are more recent, but I just want to emphasize the fact that I selected them doesn't necessarily mean that they were the first. Uh, and they're not necessarily selected because they're necessarily the best examples of, of work of a certain type, but these are uh, all well-known studies that have been uh, important and are uh, generally highly regarded. So if you want to know more about any of these particular topics, there's a reference or references are given on each slide, and you can... Uh, go to the primary literature and, and look. For much of uh, the theory, and theory is uh, too grandiose a term, but uh, for much of the equations that explain how the neutron scattering is interpreted, I would refer you to this book by Julia Higgins and Henri Benoit. Uh, this is in the list of references for the whole course, so you can get the, the full reference there. But this is a very complete and pedagogical and uh, uh, easy to read and understand treatment, so I uh, recommend it very highly. Okay, now I recognize the uh, audience comes from a quite a mixture of backgrounds and interests. So for some of you, the review of some polymer basics is going to be uh, old hat. Uh, for some of you, it may seem mysterious. And for some of you, it'll be somewhere in the middle. Uh, so I'll do the uh, best I can in a short amount of time uh, to remind you or introduce to you the terminology that we use and the concepts uh, that really form the basis of most of the use of SANS in, in polymer science. So to begin, we'll talk about the conformations of polymers. And so examples here, we have a, a, a homopolymer made out of blue monomers. Uh, next to it is a homopolymer made out of red monomers. And next to that is what we call a dye block copolymer. Uh, which is made by covalently attaching a blue polymer to a red polymer. And these uh, three possibilities uh, will form the majority of what we'll be talking about. These polymers, that, as cartoons, are said to be flexible polymers. Uh, that usually means that the backbone uh, of the molecule is a single carbon-carbon uh, bonds, maybe some double bonds, maybe some heteroatoms like oxygen and nitrogen. But there's a great deal of conformational flexibility. We talk about the degree of polymerization, so how many monomers have been covalently linked, and we'll call that capital N. Uh, there's a length scale associated with each monomer that we'll call the statistical segment length, B. Uh, and then there's a volume V naught, little v naught, that's occupied by a monomer in space. Now, this statistical segment length is not the physical size of the monomer. Uh, this is a 
a length that you can use to calculate the size of the polymer given its degree of polymerization. So that's an important distinction. So if we have a flexible polymer, uh, its conformation in space is described by the random walk model. Uh, as long as we have a reasonably big N, and if we place this polymer in the bulk or in what's called a theta solvent, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about what that means exactly, but the measure of size that we will use almost exclusively is called the radius of gyration, and that's defined over here. So these Polymers have many degrees of freedom, and so if we have an ensemble of polymers, the chances that any two of them have exactly the same size and shape is essentially zero. But there's a well-defined average size that's called the radius of gyration. And uh, in formal terms, the radius of gyration is the second moment of the distribution of monomers about the center of mass. But one way to, simpler way to think of it is just the average distance between the monomer and the center of mass. So it's an approximate size for the polymer. And if the polymer uh, is a set of discrete objects, N, the radius of gyration can be defined this way, where this quantity R sub JK is the distance between the jth monomer and the kth one. So this is a double sum over uh, all of these monomers. It's normalized uh, because there are n squared terms in this double sum. And so this is the average distance. And the average distance squared is proportional to n. So this is the classic random work result that the distance you go in n steps is proportional to the square root of the number of steps. And b is here is the length of the step. So this is the classic random walk result. Now there are other possibilities. So in general, for polymer molecules or in fact colloidal aggregates or anything else, the radius of gyration will grow with the degree of polymerization or the molecular weight uh, to the exponent nu power, and so nu is one half, as I've said, for a polymer in a bulk or a theta solvent. It turns out it's larger in what's called a good solvent. So the polymer swells due to the desire of the individual monomers to escape one another, so-called excluded volume effect. On the other hand, if you put the polymer in a very bad solvent, it will collapse into a dense sphere, or if you have a globular protein, then the radius of gyration will actually increase with the one-third power of molecular weight. And the largest that nu can be is one. That's the value down here. That's the value you would get if you had a rod-like object, right? That's length. The radius would be proportional to the length that would grow linearly with degree of polymerization. So almost everything we'll talk about in these two lectures has to do with flexible polymers. So it's these first two results uh, that will come into play. Now, typical values for polymers for n range from 10. You could even argue if that's big enough to be a polymer, up to uh, as many as 100,000, which corresponds to molecular weights over a uh, million in uh, grams per mole. B, for flexible polymers, is not that much dependent on structure. And so if you remember uh, that it's about six angstroms, you can always estimate what the radius of gyration will be for any polymer, and you won't be too far off. The volume that's occupied by a monomer in space, that depends or corresponds essentially to the density of the material, uh, and that is often about 100 angstroms cubed per monomer. But it's just important to note this is not equal to B cubed. So there are times when you're trying to calculate the radius of gyration, and there are times when you're going to be concerned about the volume occupied by a monomer. And so this distinction between V0 and B becomes important. 
However, with these values of n and these values of b, the radius of gyration for most polymers is between 10 and 1,000 angstroms uh, or 1 and 100 nanometers. Clearly, uh, you can get bigger than that, and if you have colloidal aggregates, uh, it's easy to get bigger than that. But for most discrete polymer molecules, this covers the range. Now, why are we using neutron scattering with polymers? And so there are a series of important points. We can run through these. You've heard these before uh, in some of the introductory lectures, but it's worth uh, just uh, reminding ourselves the neutrons interact very weakly with organic materials. Uh, so this means there are, in general, if we're talking about carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, we don't have to worry about absorption of neutrons. We don't have to worry about samples becoming very radioactive. Uh, the scattering uh, is relatively weak, so that if we have samples in thickness between uh, a millimeter and a centimeter, it's usually we adjust that so that the transmission is about 50%, although uh, a range of transmissions are certainly allowed. The Q range that's readily accessible with most small angle neutron experiments goes from 0.001 inverse angstroms to about 1. And this matches this range of polymer sizes perfectly, meaning that the product of QRG can be adjusted between about 0.01 and about 1,000. So if QRG is 0.01, that means the polymer is essentially a point as far as the scattering experiment is concerned. And if QRG uh, is much bigger than one, then we are looking at structure inside uh, the length of a, of a single polymer. So we can do all of that with neutrons. In light scattering, uh, which is obviously a commonly used technique in polymer science, uh, it's very difficult to get uh, to QRG much bigger than 1. So that's one of the unique features of neutron scattering. And if one goes to ultra small angle neutron scattering, it's the same experiment but a different apparatus, then we can exchange, uh, extend the range of Q down maybe two more orders of magnitude and overlap with light scattering. Now, all of this becomes uh, important for polymers and for organic materials because hydrogen and deuterium have very different coherent scattering lengths. And so you've heard about this uh, in the introductory lectures. But this really is the basis uh, for the utility of neutron scattering in polymer science. And so what this will allow us to do is to label polymers. We can make the polymer deut deuterated and the solvent protonated or vice versa. We can put deuterium in one polymer in a blend or one block in a copolymer. So we can use the experiment to look at whole chains, parts of chains, all by themselves in complicated mixtures uh, in ways that are just not possible with other techniques. In particular, it's worth briefly contrasting small angle x-ray scattering with small angle neutron scattering. They use similar wavelengths uh, and have similar Q ranges. X-ray scattering, particularly at a synchrotron, has orders and orders of magnitude higher flux and much better resolution in terms of delta Q over Q. Uh, and so it would seem to be the preferred technique by far. But in fact, uh, for organic materials, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, there's not much contrast in x-rays. And so it's very hard to see the things that you can see with neutron scattering. The places where x-rays become most important are things like block copolymers or surfactant self-assembled structures where there's a long-range periodicity that reinforces the scattering. And we'll see some examples of that in Thursday's lecture on block copolymers. Uh, 
It's also very useful, of course, uh, for looking at crystalline materials, but then you're down at the higher Q in the so-called wide-angle X-ray scattering range. So the, the bottom line is neutron scattering is uniquely powerful uh, for organic materials because of the deuterium label. Okay, so here's a quick outline of the topics I'm going to cover. So today, uh, we'll first just look at some examples of using neutron scattering to examine the form factors or the radius of gyration for individual polymers, and then we'll uh, spend most of the time uh, on the topic of polymer blends, uh, what's interesting, how do we interpret the data. And then on Thursday, we'll turn to the block copolymer slide uh, section. Okay, so let's begin by just defining what we mean by a, the form factor. So this is, for those of you who have an x-ray background, this is different than the usage in the x-ray community. But this is the form factor we're going to be talking about. It is the double sum over all monomers in a single object, polymer, particle, of the phase factor taken between all the particles pairwise. So this e to the minus i q dot r j k. So this is the, the phase factor you've seen over and over again. The average here just means we take the appropriate average. And all of the things I'm going to be talking about today are so-called ergodic systems. It means this average could be the time average or the ensemble average. They will be the same thing. There are capital N squared terms in this double summation. So we normalize by the number of terms. And so this is P of Q, the form factor. And it necessarily will be, uh, sorry, the form factor will necessarily lie between 0 and 1. And if it is 1, that means the phase factors are not really contributing anything, all of the monomers in the polymer are essentially forming one single object. On the other hand, if there's a lot of interference between scattering from different monomers, then P will be less than 1. And the way P varies with Q tells you about the internal structure of the polymer or the particle. So the most important one for flexible polymers, the most important analytical form for this form factor is the so-called Debye function. And this is, applies to a random walk chain. So P here is given by this disarmingly simple uh, polynomial, where x is the dimensionless variable q squared or g squared, or q squared nb squared over 6. I'll just point out in passing that this is a analytical function that applies uh, in the limit that QB is much less than 1, which is to say, if you start to look at length scales down on the range of a few angstroms, on the range of a monomer, this formula is not appropriate. Because this is a formula for a continuous uh, random walk in space, not one that has any local details like uh, individual monomers. But anyway, this is the uh, standard formula. And you'll, uh, you'll see it referred to uh, over and over again. Now, in light scattering, if you want to look at the form factor, uh, you do it in dilute solution. And you can do the same in neutron scattering. So this is uh, an equation, or actually a couple of equations, that just uh, remind you about the scattered intensity and what it depends on. It depends on a collection of constants, which include the so-called contrast factors for neutron scattering. And it would be the refractive index increment squared for light scattering. And KT, thermal energy, and this second derivative of the free energy of mixing with respect to composition. So this is just reminding us that the scattered intensity comes from spontaneous fluctuations in composition. So we're going to come back to this relation later on. But often what you see in introduction to light scattering is the so-called Rayleigh ratio. 
which is the normalized intensity. Uh, the, so this is an absolute quantity. It has units of inverse centimeters. And the dilute solution expansion for this is K, these constants, concentration in grams per mil, molecular weight in grams per mole, and P, this form factor. So if it's a dilute solution, this is all uh, that co contributes. The next term includes the virial coefficients, so-called second virial coefficients. And if this is a good solvent, this is a positive quantity which means that the scattered intensity increases relatively slowly with concentration. If you have a bad solvent, A2 is negative, and in fact the intensity will start to go up more strongly with concentration. So this is the classic light scattering equation. Now, P of Q depends on the shape and size of your particle, but it turns out in this regime, here, where QRG is less than 1, the so-called Guinea regime, all particles give the same answer. P of Q is 1 minus a third Q squared or G squared. This is true independent of the particle shape as long as the particles are isotropically distributed in the sample. So this is what is used all the time in light scattering. Because as I mentioned before, for polymers and light scattering Q, it's hard to get to much further into uh, higher order terms here. But for neutron scattering, we can sometimes access this Guinea regime, but often we can also get the full form of the particle uh, form factor. Now this first equation here, is often presented in the format that's called the Zim equation. It's just a rearrangement of that upper equation. And this is what's in all the polymer textbooks. It suggests a double extrapolation. If you extrapolate to zero angle or zero Q, the slope of that extrapolation will give you the radius. And if you extrapolate to zero concentration, the slope of that extrapolation gives the virial coefficient and both extrapolations have a common intercept which is the weight average one over the weight average molecular weight so this is uh, an equation you almost certainly have encountered before uh, in any sort of polymer characterization uh, textbook now just to uh, prepare you uh, the data may be presented in any number of different plotting formats. So I'm just showing four of them here. So the first is just plotting directly P of Q against normalized RG, so QRG, on a log QRG axis. And so this is what the Debye function looks like, a smoothly varying. When QRG is 1, the intensity is dropped by about 10 percent. So should should have uh, so so that's telling you, you know, the Guinea regime is up here, uh, but in neutrons we often get this whole form factor. Another popular format is the so-called Kratky format, in which the intensity or P of Q is multiplied by Q squared. So this has the effect of emphasizing the higher Q. So what was nothing down here is now the main part of the curve here. And you see for the Debye function, it is supposed to be horizontal. And in fact, this horizontal value uh, gives you B, the statistical segment length. If you're interested in extracting the radius of gyration, two common formats are the Guinea format, which takes the natural log of the intensity, and that should be linear in QRG squared. The initial slope is indicated by this straight line. So for points that fall below QRG is 1, you fit to a straight line, and that slope will give you the radius of gyration. Alternatively, you can plot the reciprocal of the intensity versus QRG squared. This is called the Zim format. And again, the initial slope 
is a, in this case a third q squared or g squared. So you get the radius of gyration from the initial slope without knowing anything necessarily about the size or shape uh, of the polymer in advance. So here are some examples of use of neutron scattering uh, to look at particular form factors. So this example, two examples here, are to look at ring polymers. Uh, so they're both uh, polystyrene. And this gives me the opportunity to tell you. So I'll show all of these examples. And in this little box uh, with green background, light green background, I will show you the monomer or monomers that are involved. Uh, so I, I'll often forget to mention it, but that uh, code will be there. So this is polystyrene in both cases here. Uh, so the earlier study that's shown here is uh, a ring polymer and a linear polymer in uh, deuterated solvent. In this case, uh, I think it's cyclohexane. Uh, it's a little hard to read. I apologize for the fuzziness of some of these images, but this is the crack key format. So this is Q squared times intensity. So curve one is uh, uh, the Debye function fit to the linear uh, polymer. And you see it describes it reasonably well uh, with some possible deviations at, at higher Q. But those deviations are not unexpected because, as I already mentioned, the Debye function really doesn't apply when you get to QB near to one. The other curve, the more interesting one, is the cyclic polymer. And you see that it has a distinctive, distinctly different shape. It has a maximum in this crack key format. The fact that there's uh, extra, extra scattering uh, is a f uh, result of the fact that the coil uh, is denser uh, because of the ends being tied together. So it's denser than the uh, more Gaussian coil or random warp that's here. This smooth curve through the data is the form factor of a cyclic Gaussian polymer, uh, which is given here. This is known as the Casasa function uh, in the literature. Ed Casasa uh, presented this result uh, many years ago uh, in a reference that's not on this slide, but you can find it in the references at the bottom. The plot over here is for uh, molten polymer. Uh, and in this case, it's there are two examples. Uh, one uh, for linear polymer. This is poly. Uh, uh, you know, now that I think about it, I think this is polydimethylsiloxane. Uh, so I have omitted the uh, chemical structure. Sorry about that. But this is the linear polymer, and this is the cyclic one. Again, compared with the appropriate uh, Debye function and Casasa function, and they, the difference is clear. Uh, they describe them well, but not perfectly. And again, at, at higher Q, there's some distinct deviations uh, that are potentially interesting. But something that this format obs can obscure is the fact that at the higher Q, the intensity is usually very small. And so therefore, noisy, uncertain, and in particular, uh, the subtraction of incoherent scattering and background uh, can is a little bit subtle. And so you have to be cautious in interpreting the data at the highest values of Q. But nonetheless, uh, these are two uh, excellent examples that show how you can use neutron scattering to examine the form factor in detail in ways that you simply could never do with x-ray or light scattering. <clears throat> now, one of the first and most famous applications of neutron scattering was to test uh, what is sometimes referred to as the Flory conjecture. And Flory proposed a long time before neutron scattering uh, was available that in the molten polymer, the excluded volume effect would not count, and polymers would become random walks, just like they are in theta solvents. So he made this prediction long before there were any experimental tests or any ways to really test that quantitatively. So this was one of the first things 
that uh, scientists did with neutron scattering uh, and polymers starting in about 1970. And so this reference is now almost 40 years old. This was not the first study, uh, but it's one of the most complete ones. So what's shown on the left is a ZIM plot or part of a ZIM plot. So it's the inverse of the intensity uh, in a double extrapolation. But this is one concentration, many angles. Here's another concentration, many angles. Uh, the fact that this slope is zero is telling us the virial coefficient is zero, which is about what you would expect in a melt. So that just means the polymer likes itself as much as it likes its neighbors. The important result here is that the radius of gyration as measured divided by squared divided by molecular weight is independent of molecular weight. So that's this set of points all the way from about 20,000 molecular weight up to a million. So this is the direct confirmation of the Flory conjecture for polystyrene. Just to show that this is not a mistake of the experiment, these data are for polystyrene in carbon disulfide, which is a very good solvent. And in that case, you see uh, a distinct increase, which in fact corresponds to this good solvent exponent uh, of 0.6. Now, one thing I will, two things, let me just, one thing I will mention quickly is this measurements were made uh, by dissolving small amounts of the deuterated polymer in the protonated polymer background and then doing different concentrations of deuterated polymer and extrapolating to zero concentration exactly as one would do in light scattering and generating a Zimplot. It turns out, however, this is not necessary to do. And this is one of the most uh, exciting discoveries in the early days of, of neutron scattering. And we'll talk about that uh, discovery and the so-called high concentration uh, labeling method uh, shortly. So here's another example of the kind of higher order question that one can ask and answer with neutron scattering uh, having to do with chain conformations. So in this case, what we're considering is the expansion due to excluded volume along the backbone of a polymer. So the expansion factor alpha uh, is defined as the radius of gyration in a certain solvent at a certain temperature divided by the random walk value or the value it would have in a theta solvent. And if you have a polymer in a very good solvent, it's expected that the expansion factor will increase with the size of the polymer. Not only that, it should depend on where you are in the polymer. So what these researchers did was take a 30,000 molecular weight deuterated block, roughly, and measure its expansion in a good solvent. Again, this is polystyrene and carbon disulfide. Then they made a block polymer of 400,000 protonated and the same 27, 30,000 deuterated block on the end. And then they made a tri-block with the deuterated part in the middle. And so according to theory, this one should expand compared to a theta solvent, but this one should expand more because it is trying to avoid the rest of a bigger chain. And this one should expand even more because the ends should be trying to avoid each other and stretch out the middle. And in fact, that was the experimental result. The expansion factor for the free small chain was about 8%. For the block at the end, it was almost 20%. And for the block in the middle, it was about 25 or 30%. So again, this is an excellent example uh, of the kind of higher order question that neutron scattering and neutron scattering alone uh, allow you to answer. So let's summarize what we've talked about now with form factors. Uh, neutron scattering is ideally matched to give you a detailed look at the form factor in a way other experiments cannot. 
the size and the conformation of the chain or parts of the chain. And you can look at the, let's say, the deuterated part uh, in the bulk or in a very complicated environment and extract it unambiguously. So these are all big advantages. So I'm going to stop now for a moment, uh, catch my breath, and give you a chance if there are any questions that have Okay, so we have a question from Ming, and the question is, in the previous slide, did you just calculate the RG of the red polymer part? So let's go back. And the, and the answer is yes. <clears throat> so in this case, I, I should have uh, I should have emphasized this. The, the carbon disulfide solvent uh, almost matches exactly the scattering length of the protonated polymer. So from the point of view of the experiment, it only sees the red part. And so we have the form factor uh, of just the red part of the polymer. So if this were light scattering, you could pick a solvent that had exactly the refractive index uh, of the blue, and then only the red would scatter light. But there's no way to do that without changing to different monomers. Deuterated and protonated polymers have the same refractive index to a good approximation. <coughs> So that's a very good question. Help to bring out that that crucial point. Okay, so we have another question from Philippe, uh, who asked, "Does this introduce an interaction parameter chi between the deuterated and the protonated backbone?" So that's a great question, and we will address that. Uh, in some detail uh, in a few slides. So I'll, I'll hang on to that question and we'll, uh, we'll get to it. But I, I can, in case you're anxious, I can tell you in this problem uh, the difference between the thermodynamic interaction between the protonated part and the deuterated part are of no, uh, no consequence. But that's not always the case. Okay, well, let's move on. Uh, so the next topic to cover is that of polymer blends. So this is a, a general term. Blend here is just a, a general term for a mixture of at least two polymers. Everything that we'll talk about, I think we'll restrict ourselves to two. Uh, and But you can think of a polymer solution as a polymer blend where one of the components, the solvent, is just a very small polymer. So now the, the word chi was mentioned, so now we can uh, talk about it more explicitly. Uh, so we have to review a little thermodynamics. I'm sure that that's what most of you like to do right after lunch, so that's good. So we're going to talk about a mixture of two polymers, blue and red. Uh, there's a free energy of mixing, uh, and what I'm showing here is the prediction of the so-called mean field of Flory-Huggins theory. Uh, but this is just one possible theory. If you have a better one, uh, you're fully entitled to use it. But this is the one, this is the starting point uh, for all discussions of, of polymer blends. So let's just walk through this equation. N, again, is the degree of polymerization, in this case, of polymer A. Phi is its volume fraction. So these first two terms combined are the so-called ideal combinatorial entropy of mixing of the two polymers. So the polymers are assumed to be uh, random walks before they mix, random walks after they mix, and mixed completely randomly. And then there's a enthalpy term uh, where the volume fractions are multiplied. So this is basically telling us uh, the chance that a, a particular site in the sample is occupied by a monomer of type A times the chance that its neighbor is type B. Uh, that costs uh, an energy penalty, an enthalpy penalty, given by this dimensionless quantity chi. So chi is the Flory-Huggins interaction parameter, and we're going to talk about that in some detail. 
But let's just note a couple of things. First of all, this degree of polymerization here and chi are, even though they're both dimensionless quantities, they are defined on the basis of a reference site volume. In the original theory, this is the size of the lattice on which the calculation is performed. But it's very important to notice now that Na and Nb are not necessarily the chemical degrees of polymerization. Because if you have two completely different polymers with different monomer sizes, you have to pick one site volume and on that basis define Na and B and chi. As I already mentioned, you can use this equation for solutions if you just choose one of the components to be the solvent and use the solvent molar volume as the reference site uh, and Na is, is set equal to 1. Now here's chi, this interaction parameter. In the theory, it's given by the product of Z, which is the coordination number. How many nearest neighbors do you have? And delta W is what's called the exchange energy. That's the energy penalty it costs you to take a monomer of A out of a beaker of A and exchange it for a monomer of B from a beaker of B. And then this is normalized by thermal energy so that this becomes a dimensionless quantity. And in the theory, this is expected to be a small quantity, much less than one. Now, in experimental practice, chi is almost always fit to the data, and it's found that it's not just an enthalpic part, something proportional to inverse temperature, but there's always an extra entropy. So in other words, this ideal combinatorial entropy of mixing is not all of the entropy of mixing. And so experimentalists just use chi to fit their data, whatever it is, and they allow chi to take on whatever attributes it needs to describe what they see, rather than to stick to what the theory says it should be. So this is a source of endless confusion. You always have to ask yourself, when people use the term chi, are they talking about using it as a fitting function or are they talking about it as a predictive quantity? Now, if you have a, ex, an expression for the free energy of mixing, whether it's the one I've just shown you or any other, you can use it to compute the phase diagram for the mixture in thermodynamically rigorous ways that are independent of whether the model is a good one or not. It's just the phase diagram that the model predicts. So for example, in the mean field or Flory Huggins theory, the phase diagram looks like this. Right? This is temperature on this axis, composition, volume fraction on this axis, pressure is assumed constant everywhere. So at high temperature, everywhere is dark blue, it's a one phase homogeneous mixture. Everywhere that it's light gray down here, at equilibrium, it is a two-phase mixture. And if we prepare a sample with a certain total composition and bring it, let's say, to this temperature, it would phase separate into two phases. One would have this composition, and one would have this one. So this locus of coexisting concentrations is called the coexistence curve or the binodal. There's another line here, a curve, which is dashed. That's called the spinodal, or it's also known as the stability limit. Uh, and we'll talk uh, a little bit about this. We will see how neutron scattering can be used to map out this diagram. The most important point on the diagram is the critical point here, where the spinodal and the binodal meet. Above the critical temperature, the mixture is miscible in all proportions. Below the critical temperature, it may phase separate or it may not, depending on the composition you prepare. And the critical composition corresponds to the where these curves meet. And I've drawn it here. It's a symmetric diagram. But in general, of course, it will not be. So this curve, all of these curves in the critical point are found from the free energy expression. So in particular, 
the coexistence curve, the criteria for phase coexistence is that the chemical potential of component one is equal to the chemical potential of component one in both of the coexisting phases. And, and the same for component two. So to find the chemical potential, you have to take the first derivative of the free energy expression. It turns out that leaves you with these logar still with logarithm terms, so there's no easy analytical expression. But nonetheless, numerically, you can evaluate where this coexistence curve is by taking the first derivative of the free energy. The stability limit corresponds to the locus of, cur of points where the second derivative of the free energy is zero. And that has an analytical expression for the Flory-Huggins theory that's shown here. So the second derivative of the free energy mixing is equal to this collection of terms over here, and we're going to see this uh, repeatedly. And if we set this equal to zero, then we get this dashed line. And the significance of this thing being equal to zero is the following. When this is positive, that means a fluctuation in concentration costs energy and will spontaneously die out. If this quantity is negative, a fluctuation in concentration will grow uh, and the sample will spontaneously phase separate. It will undergo the process known as spinodal decomposition. So this quantity being zero is the limit of stability. And when that happens, the scattered intensity should go to infinity. Uh, earlier on, I, I showed you that the intensity was proportional to the reciprocal uh, of this. So the stability limit is calculatable, and it comes out as a relatively simple algebraic expression from the second derivative. The critical point lies on the spinodal, so it satisfies this equation. And in addition, uh, the third derivative is also equal to zero. That sets this point uniquely. And for this diagram, it's symmetric. That It's symmetric because n1 and n2 were chosen equal. We'll call them n. The critical value of chi is chi n equals 2. So that tells us as n gets bigger and bigger, a smaller and smaller chi is required to make these things phase separate. And as n can easily be 1,000, then chi would be 0 0.002. Or another way of saying that is the exchange energy to exchange a monomer of A for a monomer of B would be just 0.2% of KT. So a very small penalty can still lead to phase separation for a high degree of polymerization. Now, this is the phase diagram that's predicted by the Flory-Huggins or the mean field theory, but it's by no means the only phase diagram that you can observe. And in particular, in many polymer blends that are miscible, it's a so-called LCST phase diagram, which means it's more or less inverted, that it mixes at low temperature and phase separates at high temperature. And we'll see uh, at least one example uh, of that. OK, so that's the polymer thermodynamics. I hope for most of you it's a reminder. And now we're going to go through some pages of equations, uh, not because uh, they're particularly uh, complicated. They're not. They're, we're actually going to go through them because they're relatively simple, but they give us some extremely important and useful results. So let's just suppose we have a mixture. We're not going to say yet that it's polymers, but it has two monomers, uh, one and two, A and B or H and D if one's protonated. So the scattered intensity that we're going to measure is proportional again to this double sum over all pairs of scatterers and the phase factor that you get, averaged over whatever distribution you have, and then weighted by the scattering length of monomer A or monomer J and monomer K. So we can break this double sum into three terms. One in which we're looking at particles of type 1, 
So double sum over that. Another, which is the double sum of particles of type 2. And then the cross term, one particle of type 1, one particle of type 2. And we use this decomposition of the total scattering <coughs> to define what are called partial scattering structure factors. So S11 <coughs> is just a description of how the ones are distributed in space. 1, 2 tells you about the correlations between particles 1 and 2, and 2, 2 tells you about where the twos are. This average phase factor is really just the average of the concentration of type 1 at place J and the concentration of type 2 at place K, if we were talking about S12. Right, so it turns out, of course, that the average concentration is of no interest. If the sample is completely uniform, absolutely, let's say, 30% 1 and 70% 2 everywhere, there's no scattering whatsoever. There are no fluctuations. It's a uniform medium. So all that matters is not the average concentration, but the fluctuation about the average. So that's what this delta phi 1 and delta phi 2 mean. Now, here we make a not trivial, but very useful and actually almost quantitatively correct assumption for polymers. Namely, they're incompressible, which means you have two choices. If there's a fluctuation, uh, a positive fluctuation of type 1 at some point, there has to be a corresponding negative fluctuation of particle 2. In other words, every place in the sample is either 1 or 2, that's it. No empty space, no voids coming and going, for example. So if I take 0 and just put it here, and I multiply 0 by the fluctuation of some volume fraction at RK, so I've still got 0. I now average that. I've still got 0. So this is 0. But if I take the full double sum of 0, I've still got 0. So here's 0, the double sum over these things. But that's by definition what I've called S11 and S12. You can do the same thing for S22. So S22 plus S12 or 0. So therefore, S11, S22, and negative S12 are identical. They have to be which means that the coherent scattered intensity, which we previously wrote in the most general form possible, now simplifies to just the square of the difference of the scattering of 1 and 2 and just the correlations of particles of type 1. So this incompressibility makes the answer very simple. And and physically, this is just saying, if we know where the ones are, because it's inc incompressible, we know where all the twos are. And we know everything about the sample. Now, so far, we haven't said anything about polymers. So we've got to make this a little bit more complicated. OK, so now we consider a blend where we have two polymers. We're not worrying about their interactions yet. So we'll have little n1 chains of type 1 with a degree of polymerization big n1. Similarly, little n2 chains of type 2. So the intensity now has, we've broken that sum into 4. It's a sum over all polymers of type 1 and all monomers of type 1 in a polymer. Similarly, all monomers of type 2. So there's a mistake for you. That should be uh, little n2. And this sum k should also be up to little uh, and 2 so I apologize for that so this is just a complete enumeration again of all possible pairs of monomers now let's look for a second at what we call the self terms so these are just the terms in this grand summation where the two monomers are in the same polymer so there are n1 polymers of type 1 so here's the double sum inside there and n2 polymers of type 2 and the sum inside of there. So this is just 
related to the form factors of polymer 1 and polymer 2. And I'll remind you, the form factor is 1 over n squared times the sum over all the pairs of monomers in the polymer. So this should be uh, n1 squared. The same formula applies for cross terms, and we're just going to call that Q instead of P. So we can write our partial structure factors, S11. So this is the term that comes from one chains, from monomers in the same ch chain of type 1. Here is the term that corresponds to monomers in different chains of type 1. And I'll just point out a slight simplification. This should be n sub 1 times n sub 1 minus 1. But because little n is a big number, that doesn't matter. And this can be simplified in the following way, where x is the mole fraction of 1. Similarly for 2, and then the cross term. So we know that S11 equals S22 is minus S12. As long as it's incompressible, that's still the case. Now we make a big simplification. Let's pretend we've mixed two polymers that are identical, except one has hydrogen and one has deuterium. So P1 and P2 are the same, N1 and N2 are the same. And if you crank through this, you can show that P is minus NQ. And so this result, this the incompressible two-component system, becomes this. And now I've explicitly labeled them hydrogen and deuterium. So here's the fascinating thing. No matter what the concentration X of the deuterated chain or the protonated chain, you get the form factor of the individual chain. So this result says that we can mix 50% polymer H and 50% polymer D, and the scattering will just tell us about the form factor of the individual polymer, which is a remarkable and extremely powerful result. And in fact, in the Scattering of the cyclic polymers that I showed you earlier, that was exactly how the experiment was done. So this is the so-called high concentration labeling method, and here was one of the first tests of that. So I showed you earlier radius of gyration squared divided by molecular weight. It was independent of molecular weight. Here's uh, radius of gyration divided by molecular weight all uh, square root. So this is polystyrene. This should be independent of molecular weight. But this is for a particular blend as a function of how much hydrogen and how much deuterium are in there. So this is a few deuterated chains. This is almost all deuterated chains. But the answer is always the same. So you can pick the concentration of protonated and deuterated chains that you want, whichever makes it the experiment best for you, as long as the two polymers are the same. You have one N and one P. So this high concentration labeling method has been in uh, use now for over 30 years. And I'll show you uh, later on uh, a couple more examples where that's used. Okay, now what we haven't considered is the chi or the thermodynamic interaction between the polymers. So how does that come in? And also, what happens if our two polymers are different? Not necessarily H and D, not necessarily the same molecular weight. So for that, we use the famous result of Degen called the random phase approximation. So instead of S11 and S12, I'm talking about SDD and SDH. But we know that this equals 0. We can do the same one, SHH plus SDH is 0. Uh, we can crank through a bunch of algebra, and we'll get a whole bunch of different Q terms, QDD, QDH, QHD, and QHH. So these are telling us about the phases of monomers on different chains. So QDD is the phases between monomers on one deuterated chain and on another. 
if you make this assumption that QDD times QHH is equal to QDH QDH, that is called the random phase approximation. It makes this whole system of equations simplify greatly to where the 1 over the structure factor is given by this expression. It just involves the degrees of polymerization and the form factors of the two individual polymers in your blend. And if I make take this equation and make it an experimental equation, namely measured intensity and scattering length densities uh, and volume fractions of polymer, this is what it looks like. Now, most polymers have interactions. So here's that RPA equation with no interactions. We know in the so-called thermodynamic limit, when Q is 0, P of Q has to equal 1. And RPA is a, a mean field theory, so it must give us the Flory-Huggins result. Here's the Flory-Huggins result again. So just inserting this minus 2 chi gives us this expression, which is the so-called RPA equation. And this is what everybody in the polymer business uses to fit or interpret their blend data. So it's a, an appealingly simple uh, relation. And it says uh, that if we mix the two polymers, we know the contrast factors, the unknowns, assuming we know the molecular weights, the unknowns are the form factors of the two polymers and the interaction between them. Now, I remind you, I've, I've mentioned this, that this relation is equal to zero uh, on the spinodal. And so that's still true here. So that says the intensity will diverge, will go to infinity uh, as you get very close to the spinodal. And that is the origin of the phenomenon known as critical opalescence, which many of you have probably seen a, a demonstration in one form or another. So we expect lots and lots of scattering as you approach the spinodal because the penalty for a fluctuation is getting less and less. So here's an example of the RPA equations. This is just numerically calculated. We've assumed, in this case, uh, two polymers with degree of polymerization 80. Uh, the formula then tells us the critical chi should be 0.025, pretty small. Uh, and I've made calculations here, starting with chi of 0 down here. Uh, and then as chi gets bigger and bigger, the scattering at low angle gets bigger and bigger. But I'm nowhere near the critical value, in fact. So this would go, can go up by orders of magnitude as the temperature uh, is brought down towards the spinodal. The shape of this form you can fit to the RPA, and, it, and that's what was used to calculate this. It also fits what's known as the, a more general form, the ornstein zernike form, which is the intensity at 0, 1 plus, divided by 1 plus q squared, c squared, where x is the correlation length. And in this case of a blend, that's the correlation length of the composition fluctuations. So here are some examples. Uh, and this was one of the most remarkable experiments done with neutron scattering, scattering about 30 years ago. These are blends of polybutadiene, one with hydrogen, one with deuterium, as a function of temperature. At high temperature, it looks like this ornstein zernike or this RPA fit, and so this intercept value gives you chi. But at the lowest temperature uh, used here, this scattering is going up very, very steeply. And if you plot chi that is extracted from this versus inverse temperature, you see it has an enthalpic part and an entropic part, but chi is getting bigger and bigger, and it actually hits the critical value at which is about 0 0.001. So what that is telling us is the blends that differ only in the fact that one is protonated and one is deuterated 
can actually undergo phase separation. So this is a remarkable result uh, and gets back to the question that was asked uh, earlier, and I'm going to talk more about this isotope effect in a moment. But again, let's pause now for a couple of minutes to see if there are questions. Ah, okay, it's a comment. Uh, thanks, Philippe. Apparently this slide has answered the question uh, that he asked earlier. Well, I, I'll uh, keep going, but there'll be time at the end for, for more questions. So this, this last uh, experiment immediately raises the question, is substituting hydrogen for deuterium, you know, a harmless thing? Well, I mean, obviously not. Uh, in some cases, it's enough to induce phase separation. So when does it matter? When does it not matter? Well, let's look back at chi. So this is the exchange energy. That's the attractive energy between monomers 1 and 2 minus the average of the attractive energy between 1, 1 and 2, 2. So attractive energies, W, I, J, are negative. So usually this quantity is positive, which is a physical way of saying that like prefers like. If we assume that this cross interaction follows the so-called Bertolo mixing rule, you can write this as a difference, a square of a difference. And that means uh, that you can write chi as a positive definite, always positive quantity, where delta 1 is the so-called Hildebrand solubility parameter. So whether two polymers mix or not, is going to be dictated by the difference of their solubility parameters. The solubility parameter is another way of expressing a quantity called the cohesive energy density, which is essentially how much attractive energy is there holding a particular polymer together uh, per unit volume. For dispersion interactions only, Right, so if the only source of attraction is dispersion, and this is what you would have, for example, in methane uh, or xenon, uh, then this attractive energy is approximately given by the ionization potentials and the polarizabilities, and also the intermonomer or interparticle distance Rij to the sixth power. So. On the basis of this, we can actually understand why deuteration has an effect. Because when we deuterate, the density changes and the bond polarizability changes. CD and CH bonds have different polarizabilities. So if you use that expression, you can calculate that for a monomer of polyethylene and a pedeuterated polyethylene, the chi between them should be about 4 times 10 to the minus 4. Small, but not zero. And that says, if chi is 4 times 10 to the minus 4, then a blend of molecular weight or degree of polymerization NC should phase separate. So that's 5,000, or molecular weight, in this case, of about 140,000. And that's in very good agreement with the experiment. Similarly, if we look at polymer solutions, the theta temperature corresponds to chi equals a half. If we look at protonated styrene in cyclohexane, that's 35 degrees. This is well known. But if we have deuterated styrene, it drops by 5 degrees. If we deuterate the solvent, it goes up by 4 or 5 degrees. So in temperature terms, this is about 5 degrees out of 400, so it's about a percent. So what we conclude from this is there is a non-zero effect of deuteration on chi, whether it's in solution or a blend. And it's up to you to calculate whether it's an important contribution or not. But if, uh, if you have very high molecular weight, then yes, it will be important. And if you're right at a particular phase transition, then yes, it will be important. But most of the time, uh, it's not. Now, using these uh, kinds of uh, blends and this kind of analysis, we can map out a phase diagram. So this was done for this blend of polyolefins, polyethylene, polyethylene alt-propylene. Uh, 
So one of them was deuterated. Uh, here is the intensity in the ornstein zernike form. So if we plot inverse intensity versus Q squared, we get a straight line whose intercept is I of 0. So that's going to give us chi, essentially. And this quantity is sometimes referred to as the susceptibility. And as you do it at different temperatures, you're approaching the spinodal. So 1 over I0 gets smaller and smaller, meaning the intensity is getting bigger and bigger. So, so you're approaching uh, the spinodal in this case. So in cartoon form, those measurements were made as a function of temperature coming down from the one phase region towards the critical point. And then if you take those intercepts, 1 over the intercept versus 1 over temperature, you can extrapolate and find the critical temperature. You can do the same thing for other compositions and map out the spinodal, as we'll see on the next slide. So this is the same study. The spinodal points are mapped out here. They're the open circles. Notice how the error bars get very big towards the wings. And the reason for that is you can only do the measurement down to the coexistence curve. And so there's a big extrapolation here, which is what leads to this uncertainty in the intercept. But up near the critical point, it's pretty robust. The black points are actually measures of the coexistence curve. I'm not going to describe exactly how those were done. So for each of these different compositions, you have scattering as a function of temperature that's extrapolated to the spinodal. That gives you chi. And so chi is resolved into alpha, the enthalpic part, and beta, the entropic part, uh, as a function of composition. So these are the alphas, and these are the betas, and the smooth curves, again, are the error bars. And so once you get below about 25%, or 75%, above 75%, the uncertainties get very large in these things. But nonetheless, this is a great way to map out in some detail a phase diagram. And the remarkable thing about this phase diagram is how well it's described by the mean field theory. So these curves are Flory Huggins theory uh, with a single value of chi, a single chi function applied. And it describes the results remarkably well. There are other things you can do. Uh, we'll talk about block polymers next time, uh, so I'm not going to dwell on this, uh, but it just shows that all is not quite so rosy. Uh, the yellow here is a measure of chi that I've just shown you for this particular blend uh, as a function of temperature. Describes the measurements extremely well. If we make of these two blocks and measure chi by different means that we'll talk about on Thursday, we get a different answer. And there's no way to jimmy one into the other. So all that is telling us is there's something uh, profound about the phase behavior that's not captured by this mean field theory, even adjusting chi uh, as best you can. Something else that's very interesting in these blends is when it's not mean field. And in fact, there's a prediction that if the molecular weight of the polymer is relatively small, you will cross over into the so-called Ising universality class. So small molecules never follow mean field theory, and large polymers do. So there's a crossover, and that's illustrated here for polyethylene, alt-propylene, uh, and polyisoprene. And what you, what's plotted here is this 1 over the intensity for a critical sample and this deviation as you get near to the spinodal, this curvature uh, is interpreted in terms of a crossover to this different kind of universality, different kind of so-called critical exponents. One last uh, example with blends. So now here's a very popular and interesting blend, polyethylene oxide and PMMA. Here are the monomers. This blend is miscible, so it's unusual. These two polymers apparently have an almost negligible but slightly negative chi. And here's a, a study that measures this. 
So the effective chi as a function of temperature uh, for two different blends, one where the deuterium is on the polyethylene oxide, one where it's on the PMMA. And in both cases, you see as temperature goes down, chi goes up. So that suggests that if you kept going, these would phase separate on cooling. You can't do the experiment because the PMMA turns into a glass or the PEO crystallizes. But this interesting fact that, in fact, this blend phase separates on heating. So it looks possibly like either that, that these measurements even have the wrong sign in them. But these are extremely small and very hard to measure. So this is just underscoring that this is not necessarily the easiest experiment to do. Now I have one quick example here of using neutron scattering to look at dynamics in blends and then we'll be done. So here was the experiment to try and measure the diffusion of polyethylene. So polybutadiene was synthesized and then this has the beauty of preparing two molecules H and D even though the D is not fully D it's enough to scatter but the molecular weights and distribution are absolutely identical for the two samples. Then the student prepared hundreds of layers of these polymers. Each layer is about 10 microns thick. So that was a tour de force right there. And then neutrons were sent through in this direction. So right now you've got layers of pure polymer. So there should be no scattering. But as diffusion takes place, so the sample could be annealed in an oven at a particular temperature outside the beam, as these two layers interdiffuse, you mix H and D, and you should get the single chain form factor growing in. And that's what's shown here. As time progresses, the scattering goes up. So this is very uh, unusual to have a sample where mixing increases the scattering. And the results that they were able to obtain from this study, this is the diffusion coefficient for five molecular weights. Uh, the straight line has a slope of minus two, which is exactly the prediction of the so-called reptation model. Uh, and just to put this in perspective, the polymers, if you leave them go for a second, uh, somewhere in the middle of this plot, uh, at 125 degrees C, they get about 100 nanometers in a second. So they're moving very, very slowly. But neutron scattering is a, very, is a very clever application of neutron scattering. You get very precise uh, numbers and diffusion coefficients that are very small, very hard to measure by other means, although not impossible. OK, well, let's stop there. Let's just summarize quickly. Uh, the random phase approximation equation gives us a way to interpret the data quantitatively especially if you let chi vary uh, to accommodate the results. Uh, the incompressibility assumption makes the analysis much simpler. Uh, it allows this high concentration labeling approach. It's direct information about chi. You can use it to map out phase diagrams in detail. I only gave you very quick one example of critical phenomena, but this is one of the biggest applications uh, that people have used neutron scattering for in polymers. And then I just gave you one little hint uh, of using it for dynamics, in this case, uh, diffusion. So it isn't necessarily that the ne neutron scattering is measuring the dynamics directly, as it does, for example, in the spin echo experiment you heard about from Dieter Richter. But here you're using it to take snapshots uh, of a sample in time. Uh, and we'll see an example of that next week, uh, sorry, on Thursday when we talk about block polymers and we'll look at some uh, micelle equilibration dynamics. And the last thing, we didn't talk about spinodal decomposition, but this is, again, one of the most interesting dynamic processes in polymer-polymer in phase separation and neutron scattering plays an important role in that. Okay, well, thanks uh, for hanging in there. I hope this was helpful and uh, take a couple of questions in the last couple of minutes uh, if you have any. Okay, so the uh, question from the University is, of Akron is what benefits
the sands uh, with the layers have over using a neutron reflectivity uh, experiment. And uh, so I can't remember. I, I guess you've had the lectures on neutron reflectivity, so you know, you in principle, know all about it. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, it's not clear to me that th this example I gave is, is uh, the way you would want to measure diffusion. Uh, the neutron reflectivity is, you know, has higher spatial resolution uh, in, uh, in the, let's say, the z direction. So in principle, it could give you much more quantitative uh, information about the evolution of the profile as things interdiffuse. So it's probably uh, a, a, a more powerful approach. The results I just sh shown you, I think, are yeah, 30 years old. So neutron reflectivity uh, was not commonly available, I think, at that, at that time. But I, I will mention that the neutron reflectivity requires generally a pretty large sample area. And the, the layer fidelity, your initial condition, is pretty demanding. Uh, in, in, the, in this neutron small angle experiment, you could have a lot more fluctuations in uh, initial layer thickness that would not matter uh, in the interpretation of the data. But by and large, I, I think the answer is not really any benefits uh, over doing it with reflectivity. On the other hand, if you have a, uh, you know, a more complicated medium and you want to watch things mix, uh, the three-dimensional averaging that comes with SANS might be, uh, might be an advantage. I think I'm seeing one last question coming in. Yeah, so the question from Iqbal, uh, is there any other criteria for quantifying blend miscibility than chi? Well, I guess I would, it's an interesting question. I'm going to turn it around a little bit. So uh, one question is, if I have a polymer blend, uh, is it one phase or not. Uh, so experimentally, has this blend formed an equilibrium one phase or not? And there are many ways possibly to answer that question. Uh, sometimes uh, if the refractive indices are different, if it's uh, transparent, you know it's well mixed. Uh, if you have a single glass transition when the glass transitions of the two components are far apart, that can be a good indication that it's mixed. But the neutron scattering is a quantitative measure, not only whether it's mixed or not, uh, but how close to unmixing is it. Uh, and so that's what makes it really powerful. All of these other experiments, you take a shot in the dark and you can say, yes, it's, it's mixed, or no, it isn't, or maybe, uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But the neutron scattering is quantitative. I, I didn't show this, but when you cross the phase boundary and things phase separate, even in the early stages of phase separation, the scattering is very different. Uh, so you can see it uh, immediately. So th there should be uh, no ambiguity uh, as to whether it's a one-phase system or not in neutron scattering. Now, there's one exception to that is sometimes there's uh, parasitic scattering at low angle, at low Q, that may come from bubbles or imperfections in the cell windows and things like that. So you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, but usually, by changing temperature, you can decide whether you have that interference or not. So in general, I, the answer is the neutron scattering is the most reliable way to quantify how close something is to mixing or not mixing. And that's, a, that's probably a, the single biggest advantage. Okay, I think uh, we'll call it a day. Thanks for your attention, and uh, happy to... Oh, I, one more question. Oh, no, it's a thank you. Okay. Very polite audience. Uh, so I uh, look forward to uh, Thursday.